Hi, Tim. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, no problem. I know it's very clear. I just, I just want to taste, uh, you know, the song. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we are going to. Yeah, we are going to. Uh, <coughs> we are going to have a meeting very soon. Just in a, in a, in a minute. Yeah. Gentlemen, welcome 
our Dean Professor Zhang Changchen to give us a welcome remark. Dear friends around the world, on behalf of College of Public Health, National Time University, I welcome you to this uh, online international conference on new human humanity uh, and uh, planetary health. Um, I really feel sorry because originally we want all of you to be physically in uh, uh, this uh, pretty city, Taipei, to talk about very important uh, issues of our time and the main theme of our college, which is humanity and health. And unfortunately, all of us are at war with a virus. And the virus uh, separated us uh, from uh, meeting together physically here for this conference. And, and, uh, but uh, who our our hearts are together, right? We are, are bound together to try to uh, discuss these very important issues that uh, over the years, Professor Xiong uh, Zhen has come to our college to interact with us, to you know, pave the way for us to go beyond biological science to think about public health as a bigger issue of uh, concerning uh, uh, survival of our society and also Humanities. And uh, it's particularly important during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic that uh, it's changing everything now. It's changing the world, it's changing every one of us. And uh, we felt it and uh, we are still feeling it. Uh, if you think about this uh, conference we are held in. And uh, and what will go into be in uh, days, months, and years ahead? This is a big issue that I hope we can uh, start discussing today from your expertise. I know you are all great professors in humanity uh, around the world and also the uh, important uh, big thinkers of our time. And uh, this is an unprecedented uh, challenge we humankind has uh, uh, faced uh, uh, this time. And a lot of us have not gone through the World War One or World War Two, but we know this is uh, some kind of uh, a third world war, and the enemy is uh, everywhere, and uh, friends and foes are realized every time, and some of the. Uh, uh, paradigms we are accustomed to has been changing. Uh, some of the basic units of uh, society were thinking of family, you know, relationships, distance, all these kind of things are uh, uh, changing. You know, we have to keep safe distance to save life for each other. But, you know, in, in the past, uh, probably it's five decades, we are always talking about uh, we have to bring together across the cultures, country boundaries, and now this uh, becomes a, a challenge now. So I really want to use this opportunity to have a, 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 a kind of a healthy start for our uh, college and for, or, for the public health academia as a whole to uh, bring you together to give us a, a, a very good, uh, also very healthy, impact on uh, how we just think about uh, our society and in general and our public health spheres in the future, how to merge health and humanities uh, in this uh, uh, pandemic time and also post-pandemic. Are we going to be uh, back to the normal or are we creating a new normal? That's uh, up to uh, every one of us to, to do. And so, with this, uh, I, I welcome you to this conference, and uh, thanks for uh, taking the time long difference and to try to make this two hours uh, conference uh, successful. And tomorrow we will have a, a, a next week, and we will follow up a lot of conference. So, uh, with no further ado, welcome again, and and uh, please stay 
safe and healthy in this uh, uh, crisis. Thank you. Dear Dean Zhang, Vice Dean Chen, Professor Pu, Professor Xiong, Professor of the uh, Week, Professor Tissot, Dr. Song, uh, Song Hanji, Professor Jensen, Professor uh, Chen Yenyuan, Professor Jesus de la Villa, and other very distinguished professors around the world. Welcome to this uh, online conference. Particularly, some of you uh, are from serious COVID-19 affected areas. Plague has been with human beings since the dawn of history. It is the cost we paid, we, we, we paid to foster civilization. For a very long time, prayers and superstition are the major weapons we have, we have to fight against this mysterious and intangible enemy. We've lost almost every battle, at least before Jon Snow. But death tolls were just the beginning of the pandemic aftermath. It is the technological, economic, social, or even political impact follows that have profound impact on human history. Let it be the birth of modern epidemiology, the collapse of the medieval federalism, the fall of Inca Empire, or the setback of the 21st century's globalization. Finally, we also introspect life deeper in front of death. And that is why we find love in the time of cholera. In sum, pandemics is the causes and consequences of mankind's pain and progress. Today, we invite you to reflect on what history has, has taught us and what we can gain wisdom from history. On behalf of the Ministry of Science and Technology, I would like to thank the College of Public Health uh, at National Taiwan University, and especially Dean John and his team to host this conference. Our thought is with those who are still suffering and hope that rapid test, vaccine, and effective medicine can come out as soon as possible. I wish the conference the great success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Chan and Director Lee. And now we are going to our first topic. And in this topic, the moderator is Professor Chong Bing Zhen. She is the president of Asian New Humanities Network. Please uh, let us welcome Professor Chong Bing Zhen. Also to all of you who will be viewing this and sharing this and uh, using this in the future. I have the greatest pleasure, it is a pleasure, to introduce to you the mastermind of uh, this uh, event. Our dear colleague, Professor uh, uh, Chen Xiuxi, we call him Tony. Um, you all know him, most of you, from different uh, occasions. Uh, seeing him energetic, warm, and um, welcoming always. But let me just use one minute to remind uh, to all of us uh, he's standing uh, in the uh, National Taipei um, Medical University uh, as a uh, dental school uh, doctor before he uh, had uh, moved to public health with uh, National Young University first, and then to Cambridge for his master and um, doctor PhD in biostatistics. Uh, this is his subject, and this is uh, also the um, angle that is going to help us uh, in this uh, lecture to, uh, as a biostatistician, uh, who teaches in the Institute of Epidemiology uh, to uh, uh, share with us something about the implications of this pandemic for humanities. Thank you very much. Yeah, 
dear my colleague and uh, uh, my name is Tony Chen from uh, College of Public NTU and uh, thank you so much for attending this online meeting and uh, uh, I know that online meetings actually uh, is uh, it's a very short meeting but I would like to uh, use my example uh, to also share with all the speakers you know, uh, uh, because this is the first time we have online meeting so uh, uh, 10 minutes sometimes is very short but uh, we try to be very efficient and uh, but if we have uh, some uh, delay please accept our apology uh, for such kind of delay and I would not, I would not expect to have uh, this meeting uh, you know, too long as I know, you know, Luis and also Tiso still, you know, have a technical problem, but I want to delay this meeting, and so uh, I will proceed these uh, my lectures, you know, the stages. Okay, let me talk about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. And until today, you can see we have about two million cases. Uh, for the COVID-19 uh, component case. And uh, of course, it also took a lot of days, you know, it's about the <coughs> 137,000. And you can see the case fatality since the, uh, the end of the uh, February until so far increased from 3.4% to 67%. That means, you know, it's really, you know, leads to a lot of the people dying from the COVID-19. And not only for that, you can see the recovery of these uh, infected cases still far beyond the expect. You see, less than 40% to recover from this illness. That means it causes a lot of economical uh, and also uh, some of the cost you know, to compete with the medical resources with other needs. So this is a quite uh, serious uh, pandemic, I believe. But people always think about the, uh, the disease itself and also from medical viewpoint. But today I would like to also emphasize one very important point. Please next. And this is very important, very, very important slide. And I want to use this slide to <coughs> have <a> some <coughs> point about when we are thinking about the medical uh, problem and, med and health laws, we have to see how much the eco economical laws we have already got. So, I would like to share you with, if we want to control the COVID-19, people always think about from no containment measure, uh, measures until there's very strict containment measures. So they have a various you know, strategy from country to countries. So for example, you can see the no containment measures. At the beginning, like the UK, they have used the Name, you know, the innate herd immunity and try to, uh, try to infect the young people and to produce the herd immunity in order to protect the other people you know, uh, from not being infected. But because they never expect, they still have a risk of rendering you know, the fragile people like the elderly people and the also chronic disease people dying from the COVID-19. So, although we understand this quite be very, very clever, you know, if you affect the young people to have uh, immunities, you know, after one or two years, they have an immunity, they have an immune, they can, you know, escape from infections. But uh, at the same time, they sacrifice a lot of the things. So you can see, if you take a no contemporary measure, like the uh, beginning of the UK or other, uh, some of the, the European countries, you see, they have a very uh, high fatalities. And sometimes they 
have a shortage of the medical facilities because they don't have time to prepare. So this is actually one of the uh, pros and cons. So people think about, can we have the containment measurement? And the first thing we think about is about all the isolation and quarantine service. And of course, they can reduce the imported case. And to avoid the nosocomial infection and also family infection until the communal acquired uh, 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 infection. But at the same time, they sacrifice the international business, tourism, and so on. But of course, we also create the game about the digital industry uh, for digital, you know, the meeting and also uh, digital companies. Like right now we have done. But this is a, this is a border uh, and also domestic. So when we think about the uh, the gains, we have to think about the loss in terms of the economical, uh, in terms of the uh, the uh, the financial issues. So people always use instead of the isolation and quality also have the mitigation plans. So the mitigation plan means uh, for population you have social distance. So again, the social distance right now you have, again, is to reduce the community acquired infections leading to the large scale epidemics. But again, the social distance, you know, lose the opportunity of digital, of social, and also the economical, you know, the exchange activities and also apply to the personal hygiene and, and environmental issues. And you can see this is a can reduce uh, the community acquired again, but uh, we also change the social cultures and also social norm because in some countries they don't want to put up a, a mask uh, according to their okay, uh, the cultures. And finally, and uh, for this country, you know, taking you know, the content major like the quarantine and isolation, they need the vaccine because like Taiwan right now, we don't have uh, uh, many people you know, infected with uh, COVID-19. So we need to win the vaccine. So the cons is you have to have uh, the cost for I and the D development. And you, also, you, you, you have to wait for the vaccine as well. But of course, the benefit you can get, you know, acquired instead of innate you know, immunity like the, uh, the non-containment measures uh, strategy. You know. So this is actually is uh, 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 quite interesting about how the different kind of the uh, measurement can bring the benefit, but at the same time, they can also you know, uh, have uh, some loss in terms of the uh, uh, economical and also uh, the cultural and also the social uh, uh, benefit. Next. So, next. So, about the uh, the quality and isolation, you see, uh, at the home. This is the example we already show. And uh, people think about how to uh, get the benefit by providing some of the stay home challenge. This is a quite interesting the new enterprise. And also, uh, they have. Uh, they, they have a thing about how to study, you know, to produce some really uh, innovative sort, um, and so on. And of course, they have uh, some laws of our uh, self restriction at home, and they lose the chance of the uh, social activity uh, with the people. And this is always in uh, political, uh, economical uh, viewpoint, they, they lose these, uh, the, the opportunities. Next one. And and, and of course, you see, I, how can we have this uh, COVID-19 uh, epidemic curve for different countries? I mean, of course, you can see the North Korea is one of the examples. They take the partial isolation and the politics. The, the right side is China, take the lockdown. And of course, you can reduce the second epidemic curve. But uh, you see, uh, you, you pay the price for uh, the those I already mentioned, but for the Korea, you still have very small, uh, you know, epidemic curve, uh, epidemic curve. But uh, you get, you see, you, you get, you get the benefit. Next one. 
And lockdown for the Italy is another uh, uh, bad experience uh, because this is not complete lockdown for next year. And you can see you create a large of the epidemical curve here. Next. And also this is a this is quite interesting. So according to the Q models calculations, your ICU, the bed is is uh, it's a shortage of providing uh, for the uh, patients. Next one. So there's always the medical ethics problem, you know, arising. The hard choice. In the movie, we always think about the two cases, you know, your family friend and also your your <coughs> your criminal with uh, very good information. So you have to select one. And of course, in this case, the ventilators. You have a COVID-19 patients, and you have a you have a, a, a other you know the, the disease like the, the injury. So how how did you choose that? This is always become problem. Next one. Next one. Yeah, and also the online course. You see, it's a loss or gain. You have to think about. You have to evaluate. Next one. And also you can see this is our casuals. Even in the even even. Even in the condolence, our team, you know, also suggests, and uh, the government actually, and also the you know, people in the society, you, you see, they took the, the cyber, the way of, you know, the, uh, have a condolence with uh, our ancestors. You know. So this is actually very good. This is lost again, we have to evaluate again. Thanks one. And finally, as uh, the, the two opening mark, you know, we have to create a new life with the IoT, with the, 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 the internet of the sense, to change the world. So this COVID-19, COVID-19, not only uh, change our uh, the health profile, but also change our industry profile. Finally, next one, I make the recommendations because we want to have some recommendation for this meeting for its speakers. So the, the first recommendation I would suggest trust and uh, also face in government policies, communication with the people in the society. It's always very important. Otherwise, you know, you, you, you don't know where you are. You know. And also, you have to come consider a very, very all out comprehensive revenues, you know, given the various pandemic measures. And uh, so this is what we, we think about. And uh, for each country, you should think about this. And finally, uh, for the three and four, you see uh, a new life of the COVID-19. You know, uh, change the, you know, the industry, I mean, apparently right now, from non-digital to digital. Finally, I still suggest that we have to pursue to SDG goal, part and city, it's so important. So, uh, in order to uh, have a global uh, uh, integration and help, we should follow these guidelines. And this is actually uh, 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 the, the, uh, the recommendation from my uh, Thank you so much.
the Russia and the cultural and intellectual recently, but more recently has uh, been the main uh, promoter of the Asian Intelligence Network. He's a member of the Executive Council of the SIP, and uh, she is also the chair of the SIP here at the UP Irvine space. Uh, professor Shokin Chen, you know, Professor uh, uh, at Hong Kong University, and many other Well, uh, I welcome you very much. And thank you for your intervention on this and that you will offer us an overview of humanities and relations to pandemic as well. Professor Shokin Chen, please. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. It's good uh, to be working with you across uh, time zones and, and, and distance. Um, I have a few minutes, um, so uh, I've uh, pre-taped something um, about uh, pandemics in history, before and after. Today, I'm going to just share, using a few minutes, uh, as a further reflection about uh, what pandemics in history might have taught us, whether we've learned it or not. Um, uh, at, toward the end of my uh, abstract and pre-taped message, I quoted Churchill in saying that those who uh, have forgotten their history tend to repeat it. If those who are not happy histories, then you know we need to figure out how to get out of uh, you know, uh, repeated tragedies. Uh, pandemics, uh, they're called plaques, could be one of these kind of issues uh, that uh, tend to come back to harm us. But history works as a discipline in retrospective. So when the historians in the discipline got taught, caught on the spot, trying to offer some insight, we have to go back and look at uh, these outstanding cases we have. I have a few to share today, four to five. And I'm going to be very, very crude because I only have a few minutes. Therefore, I would try to point out only one, one out of each of these cases to see. The first, Athenian plagues in the fifth century BC. You know, the attention then was on the war. Oftentimes, so what we have learned when we like the uh, uh, people from Athens, they were worried about their enemies from in a short distance from within the Spartans. They were trying to win the war with the Persians about this a uh, 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 big war, and they missed the point when refugees and others move into the town short of space and food. A plaque brought out now. Uh, just in the 90s, people uncovered the graves. So what the, was the first lesson we could have thought about is that uh, why the surprise? Why do we always have the surprise attacks? We were surprised because we were focused on something else. This is the enemy, but the Athens, they were very wise people with all kinds of brilliant minds, but they missed the points about what uh, this, uh, this, uh, this struggle could have been, which really decimated them, you know, and ended the classical uh, Greek period for all of us. Uh, what followed is an entirely different era. And, and it's only when they uncover these thousands of graves, uh, you know, that children and men and women got thrown into the burial with no um, uh, preparation that people thought that even the best of civilizations at that time, they were caught in a surprise. Okay, uh, I could move the second uh, page uh, uh, with this uh, somehow. Uh, could, okay, the, the, the second well-known case is the Black Death of the 14th century in Europe, which, you know, why uh, the population one third to one uh, half of uh, the European population uh, lasted for for at least years and come back uh, time again. You know what uh, uh, 
What was the outstanding feature in that encounter is that they were movement of people, movement of goods uh, across the land for a long time, but people had no plan. People had no plan, there was no scheme, there was no proposal, there's no values discussed, and therefore the rodents and others came back with a second surprise attack. This time, they took care of half of the population of every country. You know, the brilliant minds and so So why was there no plan about movement of goods? And because of the ideas and values were counterproductive. And that was what came. Also, fast forward to another 500 years plus, when the third, they call the third flag, the Hong Kong and Manchuria were wrapped in this. Uh, people threw their hands, both Western doctors and in Hong Kong, and Chinese doctors. Now we have finally um, come back, uh, Dr. Johnny, uh, to look over the 100,000 case records in dealing with this. And it's evident that there was no winner. Uh, um, actually, Western doctors' uh, record uh, uh, show about an even hand, and uh, about an even record of success or failure with the Chinese doctors. Uh, uh, toward uh, the uh, end of the 19th century and as people enter so quickly to the modern era. And so when the Manchuria flag hit, um, what can we learn? We, did people get it? Uh, is that what is the purpose of history? At the time, people saw the purpose of history, all of our textbooks, worldwide, not just Chinese or Chinese, uh, it's about the Republican Revolution. That's, a, that's the center speech, yes? But how about this? That's taking place at the same time, you know? Uh, we need to decide, historians and everybody else, as to whether this battle that's fought, this page turner in human histories, you know, uh, uh, in battling, struggling with uh, the germs, whether it's pneumonic or pneumonic, but in any event, was this, the, the, what, what, should this be the matter of history at that time, or uh, should we uh, continue to talk about Sun Yat-sen trying to uh, struggle with uh, Yen Shikai? All right. So my question uh, about Spanish rule is the same. The Spanish people were very ironic, but given the name of all this, we all know this uh, plan came from uh, uh, the southern part of the United States. But in any place, in any event, because they were not part of the war, so they decided to call it uh, Spanish flu. And, and that uh, flu, uh, again, took care of, they lost, we lost more lives in that than World War I. But World War I was the central stage. And so uh, the reflections I want to end my short speech with is that yes, when SARS hit East Asia, you know, East Asian countries, uh, including Taiwan, Hong Kong, and like China, and those around us, and connected with us, like Toronto and North America, yeah, we learned the lesson a little bit. Uh, so, you know, people were more uh, um, ready to surrender this time, or cooperate. Mm -hmm. uh, but what have we learned is that. Well, how about these missing chapters in history, in global history, in general history, that I'm going to come back with? Uh, and how were people in change, so to speak, in different specialties? Epidemiology, public health, uh, who, who, are we one team or multiple teams? Uh, uh, whether it's in economics or literature, history, art history, philosophy, religious studies, as you would hear today. Are we one team? or are we multiple teams? By discipline, by country, by interest, by values, and by our questions. And that's what we would want to think about as a reflection. Uh, I would focus uh, tomorrow with the second part of my speech about the mixed uh, blessings, that there will be a horizon beyond, that there will be an after, not just before and current. Uh, but we have to decide what we want to do 
uh, with history. Thank you. Suggestions that could be taken over by SIPS to address UNESCO and other organizations. Uh, um, I have a few slides to show you. Can, can you hear me well? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, my basic argument, because I will not go back to everything that is in the text that I distributed beforehand and my other video. Uh, the, the basic argument, can you change the slide, please? is that, from my perspective, there is a shift that we are experiencing, all of us, for a number of years already, which is uh, moving from uh, being a humankind, from being a species, which of course we were from the very beginning, but from moving only to be a species, something we recognize by studying in school, that we have basically the same bone structure, the same hypomuscles, the same capacities in intellectual terms, to become a, a, a common belonging system, which we can call the humanity. So this is a, 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 an important revolution in terms of the evolution of humans, uh, which is comparable to the integration to become a humankind, because before that we were not even a humankind, we were a series of ethnocentric uh, units, different disparate cultures that would not recognize any other 
the continuation of themselves. So this is the big contest, I would say, in, in cultural terms, uh, under which COVID-19 uh, impacts. On the other hand, and can I have the next slide, please? Uh, I, I, I think that we built on a tradition uh, which um, has been uh, broken to a certain extent after the Second World War, which was a tradition of having the humanities very close to the lives of Until the Second World War, uh, and it meant, I would say, is a very good example of that, because um, the understanding of medicine as a series of techniques to heal diseases, which is Unfortunately, the perception, I would not say of medical doctors, but largely the attitude of human stored medical doctors and hospitals. We go there, we bring ourselves to the hospital the same way we bring the car to the mechanic, so that it will be fixed. But fixed from only uh, a physical point of view. And this was not the old perception. So there was a long, there's a long history of conviviality between the humanities and everyday life, projecting the anxieties and the needs of everyday life into a longer uh, time series. Uh, in that sense, I would say that we are now experiencing the need to resume that tradition. Uh, okay, next slide, please. I'm trying to do this as fast as possible. The third. Uh, uh, observation is that I think we have seen already with SARS in 2003, but now because of the wider impact of the uh, COVID-19, we see it very clearly. I think there is a, a change in the attitudes of people towards a pandemic uh, situation. Every time in the past before, the cases that Professor Sean Pichan presented to us uh, a few minutes ago, the response of society was pretty much the same, which was to let the epidemic progress, to isolate the uh, uh, people that were infected, eventually to let them die, uh, to outcast them even in some cases, uh, think of, uh, of leprosy and stuff like that, and little by little, because it's again not only a recent phenomenon. For a number of years, for example, society has condemned outcast disease people. Nevertheless, this is the first time when societies are pushed to between the choice between economics and human lives to choose human life. We know it's not totally consensual, but it's clearly the dominant trend in the planet. And this, I think, is tremendously interesting and very positive about it. Of course, it's not that people don't understand the economy, but we are not accepting at least the majority of people is not accepting to let anyone stay behind. And this is very, very positive. Next slide. Um, so I, I think there is, at the core of this, a new understanding of the human. And this new understanding of the human is based on the notion of dignity of the human person, each human being, not only a collective. And it is a collective. It's an understanding of the collective through the, the appreciation of the individual. So I would say there's nothing more humanistic and closer to the humanities than this. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the current context, of course, is, is a, a, was already a context of economic pressure from my, my perspective. I will not go back. I don't have time for that. But against, the, I would say, the dominant in, uh, approach, uh, myself, I follow those who believe that after 2008, we are, we are clearly in a new depression, like in 2009, uh, sorry, in, in uh, 1929. And uh, the characteristic of a depression is not being all the time with the economy shrinking. On, on the contrary, the economy can grow, but there are other features, and we are in that, in that context. And COVID-19 is coming to recall us that we are in a depression. By definition, a depression requires a complete change in the mindset and a complete change in the economic system. Mm -hmm. The next slide, please. Okay, the end. This implies new perceptions of the landscape. 
a new perception in which the dimensions of culture and economy can be brought back together. Again, I think medicine can play, and, and health in general can play an important role in that. Because everyone understands that in the current situation, it's not only about killing people, but it's about alleviating them. It's about caring for people. And so there is a humanities dimension in the hospitals in the middle of this disaster. While the economy goes down, give me just one more minute, please. We have to think how the economy can grow again. And then a strong economy is based, first of all, on the perceived needs of people. And the needs people perceived three or four months ago are no longer and will no longer be the same. The world has changed and the past will not come back. Things that people now feel the need for, of course health, but also conviviality, also uh, appreciation of diversity. People are, are feeling the, the lack of that when they are uh, sitting at, in their houses without the possibility to move around. So that's how the economy can be growing again. So I think, uh, for example, and I, I will close with this, everyone understands now that almost all the news they get are bad news. Which are the good news people get? They get good news, for example, when they see people singing the balcony, and that's music. They, they get bad, good news when they can visit museums online. That's cultural heritage. Setting of priorities in the moments of hard stress is, of course, the need of a salary in the end of the month will be fundamental. And so, bringing together the need for the salary and the wider needs in terms of humanity, I think, will be the outcome of, in terms of economics. And that's, I would say, how the contribution of humanities should be to explain that there is a continuum between health, economy, and quality of life, and becoming humans uh, in, in a full way. Thank you very much. And sorry for taking too, too long. Yeah. 
Yes, echo. specifically in the epidemics and for 
1974, the great malaria specialist, the American professor, medicine professor, Bruce Schwartz, published an article on the link between air traffic, which was booming the growth of problems and epidemics. The point of that I called the first industry has greatly increased the risk of transmission and greatly increased the difficulty of preventive action. And uh, this article, still in 1974, led the French scientist, the demographer, Jacques Cordai, to extend uh, the, the Schwarz thinking and I pointed out that, and I quote, the international regulations that have been in place in Spain were prevent transmission of certain opinion have been thoroughly well observed for some two years. However, during the 1960s, rapid development of tourism prompted the immigration authorities to relax their vigilance. Advances in commercial aviation contributed significantly to this. So, uh, each in their own way and using their own knowledge, these two scientists put their finger on a phenomenon that we didn't want or could not foresee the impact of the uh, uh, And this is why I choose the novel of Thomas Mann to remember how uh, uh, the famous writer uh, see or saw this uh, uh, epidemic. And uh, actually, in this short story, Death uh, uh, in the Net, Thomas Mann, can you put the next uh, uh, say, please? It is a uh, uh, famous uh, short story. Thomas Mann, wonderful if we can use that word, describe the process that leads to tourists. We hope in the meshes of an earth from which they can constantly extricate themselves. And beyond this masterful story, mastery, he is intrigued that sees a writer who starts passion back. Take a nomadic passion for a tomato, is very shrewd observer, holding the underhanded spread in the middle for what called, unquote, one of what we call Indian quiver. Uh, the next uh, slide, please. And uh, Thomas Mann. This is the original edition of the Thor Dino Pandemic. And in his uh, uh, short story, uh, Man has to see how the epidemic has spread in Europe, and particularly in Venice, and how it affects the city and its inhabitants, and especially its tourists. And in his demonstrations, Thomas Mann describes a process that can be divided into several stages. First, the Asian origin of the epidemic, the Indian origin of the epidemic. Second, the arrival of the epidemic in the world. Third, the identification of what we call in French, I don't know if you read this, this uh, zero patient, the patient zero. Or the transmission of the epidemic in the city. Fifth, the symptoms of the epidemic on the uh, uh, people. Sixth, the measures taken by the authority. Uh, seven, the reactions of the public, the tourists. And uh, finally, eight, the uh, uh, in terms of either uh, 
Die Fahrtschule ist also zum Teil. In der nächsten Zeit, die ist ein wenig viel nicht, in der nächsten Thomas Mann, I want to say, was published in 1912 and written during the time where Federa, as a pattern of his army, its presence felt in Italy in 1911. So, uh, Thomas Mann was in on uh, describing the real epidemic, it's not just fiction. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Of course, uh, everybody uh, knew, knows this film. Uh, uh, I am a channel of uh, Uchino Visconti with a remarkable uh, uh, Morgan. They, the uh, uh, writer in this film, is a musician, uh, uh, Ashen. And we can see in the film some scenes where we uh, the epidemic is visible, and we can see the other uh, uh, sides. Please, we can go with the other side. Yes, you can see the man in the station, very ill. The next one, please, and the tourists around them. Uh, next, please. Yes, you can see the ashen bar around them. You can see the horrible scene of people. Lying on the floor and on the fire, trying to diminish the impact of the cholera. The next phase, and the end of the thing, of course, is a test of Ashenda because he doesn't want to leave the niece. He was really obsessed by his young man, Adjo, and I think this is a symbolic view of what Thomas Mann. That you, the next one, is this young man is maybe the symbol of the evidence because at the end, passion that. So the short story of Thomas Mann can be seen as an example of what is happening with the COVID 19. It's a little bit. Of eight steps mentioned, most of them actually fit the present situation. And those the effects of globalization, the global reaction, the manifestation are in many ways the same forces. It is the question of taking at face value the writing, the writer whose immense power of imagination and suggestion is well expressed. We know that the past has been literature and history are very complex and problematic, and in depth study of the sources used by Thomas Mann to describe this Indian cholera epidemic to be important. But the description does not bear as high as our minds about population and or, or geography area. But I think this has helped us to analyze the infection process in its tragic sequence from the arrival of the epidemic Implication to the form uh, of departure of Crown Car. And this sequence leads to a multiple quality of stories of activity, with Thomas Mann, their deaths personified by the hero, Ashima, the, is the only outcome that is to be hoped that, that after COVID 19, the uh, reverse will take place. So thank you very much for your attention.
thank you so much for uh, <laughs> all speaker. I mean, I'm, I'm very sorry because uh, uh, sometimes you have a technical problem. But I will, I will suggest all of you uh, speaker, the next uh, three speaker, you know, please uh, turn off your computer because otherwise there's the echo, you know, of uh, your song. Yeah. So uh, just uh, do it, you know. And uh, any uh, any technical problem, you just you can uh, let us uh, know during the break. We are going to have a 10 minute break, then we come back. So, so, so please, let tell you, when you go back, when we go back, yeah, so a quarter to six, yeah, a quarter to six, we come back again, you know, for, for the next three uh, lectures. Thank you so much. Excuse me, uh, Professor Tim Jensen, can you hear me? I want to take a few minutes, um, a few minutes of your time to check the microphone is okay or not. Hello, Professor Ting Yansen. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, very clearly. Yes, That's I want to. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope everything is okay. Yeah, very good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. What about you, Tim? Hello, Tim. Tim. Professor Louis, can you hear me, Professor Louis? Uh, Professor Tony Chen want to uh, talk with you. Hi, Louis. How are you? Louis, good to see you. Yeah, are you there? I, I want. I want to let you know, I asked them to really ask uh, five questions. And uh, I, first of all, I tell you one question is uh, specif specified for you. So I want to give you see questions right now. So I asked them to put on questions. So can you, can you check, the, can you check uh, whether you can receive the questions? Where are the questions? Yeah, that's why I'm sending to you right now. Ah, you send by email. Uh, I sent I sent by email. I also put on the the web page. Yeah, so you can you can see website. Yeah, website. Web page. Website. Web page. Website. Website. Website as well. If you go on the website, then you yes. see the. <laughs> and where where. How do you get to the questions from floor? I already asked them to uh, to prepare the question. So they 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 keep up a question already. Okay, so let me check here. Uh, uh, let me know the question from the For program agenda. Can you see this? Agenda. Okay, program agenda. Yeah. And slide down. Ah, in the bottom. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bottom. question from flow. Strange. 
just go down. Yeah, you just you just go down. I think the, the course question is just for you and me, you know, new normal yeah, life. You, see yeah. that? you go to agenda, which yes. I do. Yeah. But if I go to agenda, yeah. I get the program, but I don't get anything, I don't get the questions from the course. It's strange. Yeah. You have to go down the path with the, the, the button. You have to go down the path with the button.
that for example, if I went to uh, went to uh, a piano bar or some kind of bar or a KTV, I had a history with you know bar girls, uh, talk with a bar girl, and enjoy a lot of time with you know a lot of people in the bar, and I finally I. Uh, one of the, the bar girl was concurrent for COVID-19 infection and went, well, everyone need to discuss where he's go he was going to and what person he has been contacted to. So all this issue must be discussed. If I discuss honestly, I think my wife will not be very happy with me. So this is a very important issue or conflict between to protect the public health good or to protect the confidentiality and privacy. And the third issue I would like to say is that at the very at the very beginning when the pandemic started, there is a panic about the shortage of surgical masks in Taiwan. And as you guys know, now Taiwan become the second largest mask production countries in the world. But uh, so there is uh, everyone wants to to know who is going to have the surgical mask first, who is going to use the ventilator first, uh, who is going to be sustained by ECMO for, for uh, circulation and respiration first, and who is going to take the ICU bed first. So that is associated with allocating scarce medical resources in face of uh, public health crisis like uh, COVID-19. So today, I'll be more focusing on this issue so let me uh, get you guys back to the definition of public health ethics. So this was defined. This is defined by the CDC of the United States. So four very important issues. The public health ethics resolution will be mainly depends on the ethical principles, the value, the value and the belief of stakeholders, scientific evidence, other important information, and so on. So there are two purposes for public health ethics. The first one is to maximize the welfare of, at the population level. The second is to, to allocate uh, social resources justly. There are four points which are usually emphasized in public health ethics. The one is the, the uh, public health ethics is usually concerned about population, and they usually take action to, to prevent the disease and the injury. For example, we usually conduct detailed uh, contact history investigation to stop uh, local transmission before the local transmission is actually happened. But usually there, there must be a governmental actions like to conduct strict uh, uh, epidemiological investigation. And the last one is uh, the, the public health ethics decision is usually the consequentialist orientation. So I was surprised with uh, a, a Chinese news like one one month ago, and I saw you know an, an Italian physicians simply depends on age of a patient to distribute who to decide who can use the ventilator. I, I, I was I was a little bit surprised with this Chinese information. So I grabbed out the paper published in New England Journal of Medicine saying this situation, and actually age is the determining factor uh, is practiced by Italian physician, and, but this is cannot be uh, clearly disclosed to the public because they they were short of ventilators. They must decide who is going to use the ventilator first. So is age the, the only determining factor for using ventilator? So this plus shows that you know the the eldest age group has the highest mortality rate in COVID-19. So it seems uh, acceptable to get their ventilator away for the younger people because they always die, they usually die. Is that true? So let me tell you, you know, the purpose, one of the purposes is to maximize the welfare of the population. So when you give a ventilator to a patient, you expect the patient is going to survive if the patient is going to die, I don't want to give the ventilator to him. So the question will be rephrased to who is more likely to survive after using a ventilator? 
is age the only determined factor, or the severity of illness is the determined factor for predict the patient's survival? Of course, we all know that severity of illness is better predictors than the age to predict the outcome of a patient sustained by ventilator. As we know, age with, is one of the factors associated with the severity of illness, but not the only factor. We have, according to literature, we have gender, we have glasgow coma scale, like some kind of neurological score, or uh, we have comorbid condition of the patients, like how many is chronic disease he or she has. All these factors determine the severity of illness, and the severity of illness may be the main considering factors that physician have to give or not to give the ventilator. But this is only the scientific evidence. We still need a lot of issues like ethical principle, we need to follow that. Like in public health, we have precautionary principle, we have harm principle, we have reciprocity principles. And we also need to know the value and the belief of the stakeholders. And also, we, we need to have scientific evidence and other important information considered by the society. But this is a public health crisis. Just two months period from the starting point. It is very difficult to have sufficient value and belief for the stakeholders, very difficult to have convincing scientific evidence for physicians to make decisions, and other important information. So if we have better factors to determine who is going to use the ventilator first, like severity of the illness, I would suggest our age shouldn't be the only factors to determine uh, whether or not to give a ventilator to a patient. Thank you.
in the United States on complications and leaders insisting to meet despite of the ruling saying social distance. You have, of course, therefore also seen leadership and communities trusting more in God or in scriptures interpreted in specific ways than in the public health authorities. You have probably also seen people declaring that since they were protected by God and their um, armor of faith, they could lick tribes, they could expose themselves all kinds of evidently not so healthy action. Because nothing could harm them if they had their armor of faith. So we have lots of those examples. But we must not forget that this is not black and white. And we also have lots of examples of religious communities, religious leaders, who do not only believe in supernatural causes and supernatural agents, but who are well aware of the natural causes and therefore also of medical cares and cures, but also respecting the secular authorities and the medical science and not just their scriptures or their natural, supernatural belief systems. So we have seen leadership being very responsible, telling their congregations, yes, you go pray, but not only pray, you pray while you wash your hands. And each and every time you wash your hands, you can say a prayer, but don't only say prayers because that's not going to help you. We have seen, of course, also responsible leader keep saying the best way to meet your Easter is not in church, but separately in front of the online transmission of a single handle of standing in an empty church. To love your neighborhood is staying away from your neighborhood or your neighbor, to God, but in human form also. So yes, we have seen both and, and nobody can come and say that religion is just bad or good for the public health or individual health. But of course there are dangers. Nobody should of course trust that laying on of hands can cure things, it cannot. And it's criminal, of course, walk into a congregation if you are infected with something that can lead to the death of others and of course you can maybe rightfully be accused of actually committing or intending to commit murder. So we will see in the future what happens. We will see what happens to religion, religious traditions, groups all over the world after COVID-19. I think that we will see more sort of mixture of secular and religious approaches. We will also see, of course, that some of these groups will take advantage or try to take advantage of the situation and sort of use this for their missionary endeavors. But we also see other groups being very responsible, withdrawing their missionaries from places around the world and instead only doing online missionary work. So we will see a mixture of everything as we have seen it in the past. It doesn't make sense to ask whether religion is good or bad. It depends on who are the religious people and what are they doing with that religion. And it's exactly the same today and it will be the same tomorrow. It is not gods who create religion as human beings who create gods. And therefore, religion is what human beings make out of and nothing else. What we have to put on is some kind of religious people who also recognize that they are also responsible in regard to what Luis called humanity across borders. Thank you.
三峡的下午。I think he's trying to connect now because he has somehow he's taken the time to be the afternoon time in Spain. Um, so if you could go up for one or two minutes as he connects, maybe you could summarize a bit about his paper uh, that uh, you have introduced. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, while we're waiting, I think we uh, uh, might hear from Professor Jesus uh, that are doing all those. Uh, the history of literature in terms of an epidemic. So he's basically surveying uh, literature, right, Western European literature, from uh, uh, the ancient Greek time until the modern period from the uh, historian Jesus Christ to modern writers such as Thomas Mann and others. Uh, it's basically, I think, uh, interesting in looking at what the usual medical uh, records of that nation that is about the human aspects of uh, when of the uh, epidemics, so, uh, not only about the symptoms and effects of the cure, but also about the effect of uh, all these uh, terrible uh, situations that have affected humans. So this is uh, one very uh, important uh, area that public health medicine and humanity intersect. And I think uh, for me, it is very interesting to, uh, to uh, mm. uh, 
think about this uh, connection between uh, what has to be done, what has to be managed from a medical point of view, and what has to be managed from a psychology, uh, art, history, uh, all these uh, insights. Hello? Yes, good. Hello? Hello. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Please, uh, yeah. Okay, so we have our president, the Susan Taravira Bobo here, so please, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. And um, thank you, excuse me, for the uh, misunderstanding of the time table. Okay, as I suddenly wrote, I wrote in my, in my answer, I wanted to stress several points connecting uh, or concerning the humanities and epidemics. Mostly, it will be some indication as you could propose the intellectual as a way to better understand uh, epidemics and pandemia. It's well known that, of course, particular science and particular um, well, yes, the way of uh, going into the into the study of epidemics can get uh, partial information of different way, different aspects of it. But uh, humanities, mainly history, philosophy, and I claim of literature can help us to understand the whole thing, the whole the whole aspects, human aspects of uh, epidemics, and mainly. Several uh, points and several uh, details that are, are not usually or easily uh, found in scientific literature, we can say. For example, everything has to do with the human reaction to in front of such a terrible thing as an epidemic. For example, I, I, I of course gave some some examples. Um, taken from literature from different countries and different languages and different times, uh, I show, I try to show how aspects as, for example, the human reaction in front of this, of an epidemic, the generosity, the egoism, but also the recourse to religion, towards religion, also aspects as the um, apparition of products and also xenophobia and so are very really well, very well reflected in literature. I gave several, several examples, the first one and the oldest one in the Western literature is that of the, of the, uh, the description of the play in Athens in 430 in, before Christ, before the Common Era in Athens. To see this, sh uh, show it how uh, the, the people reacted in front of that. And in particular, he presented several aspects, several details that are not clearly uh, reflected in other, in other um, records. For example, how the uh, people react um, in the common, in the normal relationships to others, how they decided not to take care of their own goods and of the money, just wanted to spend all of them, all of it, because they didn't have time to, to, to well, in the future they thought to spend it, to work, to spend it. And also how, in this case, and it's curious, religion was abandoned because people thought that gods were not interested in them. In any way, in any case, I also send some other cases, as for example the uh, record of the play in London in the 17th century, and some others in modern time. So just to finish, I want to stress this. Many aspects, and very important aspects, of epidemics are presented and are recorded, and are, and are the object of some reflection in um, subjects part of humanities as for example literature and we must be very very, very aware that there we can find very interesting information about that and overall there is something that is difficult it's not it's very, very not very often presented 
in the in, in specialized uh, studies and publications, and it is how normal life, normal relationships, for example, things as, as, as love, as familiar relations, as the work, the normal, the normal jobs, uh, can or try to continue all along the epidemic time, and how this will be probably the basis, sure the basis for the recovery after the epidemic. Well, this is a, a, a summary of what I wanted to present to you. And um, well, thank you very much for attending my, my presentation. Thank you very much. Switch the slide, please. Uh, the, um, 
uh, uh, we, we all know uh, this, and uh, this is an illustration of uh, uh, the first century uh, Roman culture, which uh, is treatise on uh, architecture, when there is a famous part about the human proportion, and of course for the Renaissance artists and architects, uh, it was an important um, question how the human anatomy can be related to the uh, art. On the next slide, we can see um, the uh, more uh, direct influence of anatomical uh, studies, even this section on uh, the early modern artists, including the same Leonardo. And on the next uh, slide, um, a bit uh, later, uh, more than a century later, we have Renan's famous um, portrait of uh, Dr. Nicolai Stuart. It's practically a group portrait of the guild of the surgeon while showing him and he is uh, explaining to uh, his colleagues. And then uh, in the next slide, in Jericho's uh, painting, uh, it's, it can be a nice illustration for uh, the increased interest of the romantic uh, uh, artists uh, uh, towards the human soul and the depth of the human psyche, uh, uh, also with the representation of uh, mentally or um, psychologically ill people, for example, this old lady with a gambling mania. And uh, the next slide from the early 20th century shows a self-portrait uh, during the uh, Spanish flu. But these are just a few uh, uh, well-known examples how uh, previously, in the previous centuries, the question and issues and considerations of medicine resulted in uh, sometimes new approaches or new uh, novel subject matters and how it influenced the choice of topics of the artists. But what we are experiencing now, and this is very interesting, is that uh, the uh, COVID virus and also the um, so the whole um, global lockdown fundamentally changed uh, how an artist uh, can work on a longer term and on a longer um, uh, time uh, frame. So, uh, of course, uh, the most evident um, effect can be uh, that an artist cannot have access to his or her uh, studio uh, during the lockdown unless he or she is working at home or even if not the studio, but there be supply stores, or uh, just imagine an artist working with large-scale bronze sculptures and cannot go to the sculpture and so on. So it definitely holds for the longer period the uh, uh, production of, uh, of the uh, artworks uh, being uh, these uh, premises inaccessible. Uh, but for not only the creation of the art, but also uh, the showing and the selling of the artwork uh, is definitely disrupted. So the uh, for-profit commercial galleries uh, or also the art fairs are uh, closed and cancelled respectively. Um, and uh, the other uh, like uh, large museums or uh, festivals and BMDs are also not open for the uh, visitors. This is why regularly we can uh, read news uh, uh, about the different um, art institutes asking for help. A financial help for the state because uh, uh, currently, obviously, they are lacking their regular income, for example, the entrance uh, tickets. Uh, what is uh, inspiring, however, and this is when it becomes um, a bit more optimistic, uh, that the uh, creative uh, artists and professionals very soon came up with solution how to nevertheless provide some uh, cultural content for those uh, interested in art. So, for example, in the next slide, uh, you can see. And, um, and uh, a detail from a newsletter from a Spanish gallery where uh, I am subscribed to, but it, it's uh, of course just a random example, so I could have shown many, many other examples how um, a, a commercial uh, the uh, gallery uh, has put together uh, an interesting um, a choice uh, an artist and a group, an artist, a group of artists for an online uh, uh, exhibition. Or in the next slide, we can see how uh, the art uh, fairs are also changing to online viewing platforms, including not only the uh, booths that the galleries can show and sell their works, but also the collateral events that uh, are put uh, online. This is what we can see in the next uh, slide. That uh, is uh, here how, for example, the uh, art catalog, the, the catalog of the art fair in Dubai went online. And in the next slide, uh, we can also see a screenshot how the uh, um, 
very uh, physically uh, inspiring um, a talk, roundtable discussion, and presentation were also broadcasted online. So for those who went to this fair, not necessarily for the purpose of buying, acquiring any artwork, but just simply to learn about and um, um, artworks. And I find this very interesting and uh, really created that uh, galleries and art and, and uh, the art that I put together this uh, inspiring uh, material. Also, on the next slide, you can see how uh, another gallery is uh, creating a weekly logbook or a weekly diary uh, uh, to uh, provide uh, information about their artists. Now, in this way, we can say that it's almost paradox, but uh, that now we are confined in these four walls, we can have uh, almost more easily high quality access uh, to a uh, very interesting uh, cultural context. Uh, so, um, the uh, practically these uh, institutes, for and non profit art institutes, are competing for our online attention, just as previously they were fighting for our uh, physical presence, and it's very uh, interesting. Uh, from all this, what I wanted to uh, uh, tell is a kind of summary that um, this will definitely uh, have some long lasting impact on the way how we can uh, enjoy uh, visual artworks. Um, this is what I uh, wanted to um, tell at the end that um, uh, although we are still in the middle of the crisis, but we already have a few questions that are definitely worth uh, to be investigated further. So this can open new paths of um, uh, research uh, for the uh, future. So uh, just to mention you one or two of these questions, for example, what will happen with the famous photograph of the art uh, of that extra ended aesthetic value when we are uh, uh, in the close vicinity and observing the original uh, artwork. Or, for example, regarding the festivals and the NPRs, will the uh, general public want to continue traveling to these events where they look and uh, satisfied by uh, viewing the works that are uh, online and traveling less? Or for the e commerce, we could continue this uh, mushrooming of the online viewing platforms that we will continue uh, after the end of the pandemic, or it's just a temporary situation. Or if we will uh, continue getting and even reading these well curated uh, online newsletters from the galleries, uh, because now, of course, we have a little more time to uh, absorb them, but uh, when the life we start, perhaps people will uh, not have the same amount of time. So these are a couple of interesting consequences, and I think it's really worth uh, observing how it will develop in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for those and I, I have uh, excellent, I, we, we will make a contribution to the journal, you know, definitely, I, uh, it's our preview. Yeah, I will have a keep track of uh, all the things to, uh, to make a contribution to this uh, very, very uh, uh, good journal. Okay, I think, thank you again, yeah, so I think we, uh, right, we turn to the uh, discussion section, huh? So, I I uh, uh, I just you know uh, put the discussion and uh, uh, put a discussion before the recommendation and uh, also the uh, <coughs> uh, uh, suggestion because I we have already seen uh, 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 several participants from the Asian country already ask question I think would it be better to answer the question but before uh, they answer the question I make sure all our speaker and also participant can see the question. Should, should we just a minute to show how can you get the question? Okay, so this is, this is a question, you know, you, you can see. So, uh, I think for first, the first question, you know, uh, uh, no, this is not for second, this is a new moment life. Is this a first question? Okay. Can I, can I, can I go to this new normal slide? Yeah, this is. Can I make sure everyone see the question? Okay, 
So I, I suppose everyone already uh, read the question. Uh, this question is from Majula from Malaysia. So she's wa she wants to ask the new you know normals. So I would ask our dean you know to make this comment first. Is is ready for dean? Uh, thank you, Madura. It's an excellent uh, answers, and uh, uh, but you know we really don't know the exact answers that are because we are still in the process of uh, creating the new normals. But for sure, if you look at this kind of mass gathering because of social distancing, there is just no no way we will have the conference as we had before. Mm -hmm. And this will be uh, in the future. Will this kind of uh, uh, remotely uh, held, remotely held conference become normal and uh, uh, physically uh, together uh, at a conference will be abnormal. This is uh, we have to think. So they come back to the education and work. So uh, the classrooms that together students and teachers together in a campus is, will be of a normal in the future. So there will be more uh, individualized uh, instruments for people to interact. So our college has been thinking uh, we have probably have to convert classroom to uh, office because we don't need classroom now. And if you are having the education, the, currently we have uh, like 100 classroom and you can have 100 courses. In the future, you have one pipeline and you want to have 1,000 uh, cl classes together on that uh, streams. And the demand for that will be uh, unbelievable. So in the future, the classes will be held in sequential and not in parallel. That's, so this is a, a, a kind of thing. Then work. So every day, I get up and uh, commute to a place to work would be of a normal. Most of the time, you will spend time at home, work from home. And when you are in this working place, you will work there and live there. We saw uh, Google and Amazon has, uh, Google and Apple, they redesigned their workplace has more pressures and a playful. So that will affect the setting, the, uh, the structure of house. Our house used to have a bedrooms and living rooms. Now you have to have kind of working space at home. So all this could, uh, could, could change our society a lot. And in Chinese uh, culture, we use two treasures. There's three generations living together. But through this industri industrialization, become atomic family. And people are talking about the reason for high mortality in some country because the family living together. That used to be a treasure, now it's a hazard. So the concept of family in the future will be changed. Then lastly, as you can see, we are wearing masks now. And a lot of societies say you have to go we all must if you go to the public. We all, in the future, in the public, we cannot see each other because we have to wear masks. So uh, how can we recognize each other? So the best way is through this uh, social media and we can really see each other. So all this is changing and how it will become is depends on us. So I think this uh, conference is really come to the right time. And uh, we are not looking at just uh, immediate threat. We are really uh, thinking about the biggest challenge to the humanity. <laughs> uh, 
and then you know, we are creating new humans now, right? So, uh, that's what I, uh, my, my answers. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for being, you know, to uh, reply to this uh, question. Uh, I think uh, we can we can we can come back, you know, uh, after the second question because they are related. So. The second question, you know, uh, again is Matsuda, you know, uh, asking from social distancing, you know. So this is a very really important concept during this uh, period of the pandemic, COVID-19 COVID pandemic. So for this question, I will ask uh, Dr. Chen, you know, to uh, uh, make some comment and uh, maybe for these two questions, we can, uh, we can come back, you know, to ask uh, you know, uh, one or two experts to make an additional comment. Yeah, Dr. Sun, please. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you for calling me to well, answer this question. But this is not really answer, but I think I, I will propose some, some of my points. So, social distancing, I find the definition about the social distancing. I think this question implicitly means that the, 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 the question who proposed it think that social distancing includes not only physical distancing but also the social humanity distancing. I think the question would be that. But I find the definition of social distancing on the Wikipedia, it means, well, social distancing includes avoid physical contact. Uh, school culture, workplace culture, canceling mass gatherings, travel restriction. Everything is now, most of the governments in the world, most of the country in the world, propose. So now in Taiwan, we, we don't have that, that much, but I think in the United States, they have avoid physical contact. My sister would be there, and the school closed, the work, workplace closed, and the travel stops. So, uh, but so social distance is actually equal to physical distance. But the other important part, which I agree with the, uh, this question, that social distance may include the social humanity distancing. That means, you know, although we have physical distancing, but uh, my wife and I, maybe I want, I, I, I'm quarantined, and we can, you know, relieve our uh, emotional stress or you know the caused by the social distancing by like calling each other. So I think the current technology or future technology may relieve the social humanity distancing. But physical uh, social physical distancing can relieve the transmission of the the virus. But the social humanity distancing actually has nothing to do with relieving the uh, the spread of virus. And this is my comment. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for Dr. Chen. Uh, I think uh, I would like ask uh, uh, the the one expert uh, uh, to make uh, uh, the uh, additional comment and who wants to. Want to make a comment or a reply to these two questions? Because we can control, we control the, your your voice. So, uh, if someone wanted to uh, uh, to make a comment right now, just let us know. I will open. Uh, ask them to open your gate. Yeah. Anyone want to make a comment? Okay. Uh, if not, uh, let's proceed to the, the next question. It's for uh, Luis. Huh? Luis, no, no. That's the question. Five, so, right? uh, Luis, uh, are you there? I am, I am. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So they want to ask you about the, they want to ask you about the dignity aspect. Yeah. So 
The question from Poon, from uh, Vietnam. Yeah. Sorry, because the questions are changing all the time. Which, which one actually? Yes, we cannot treat them. No. Yeah, let me. Uh, Luis, uh, <clears throat> in the meantime, the search, uh, I read the question for you. It's a question he he asked about from humankind to world, human beings through epidemic, and your title, you know, you highlight the importance of the dignity of the human person in contemporary time. What we can see from traditional response to the pandemic is not dignity. Uh, relevant. So do you think what challenge we are having with the current response of different countries to COVID-19 pandemic from a dignity perspective? It's okay for you? Uh, I, I, uh, okay, thank you. Um, sorry, because the connection is not very good, but can you hear me? Yes, we, yes. we can hear you very clearly. Yes. Because I have some difficulty in the following, but uh, okay, I, now I understand. Um, I would not say that traditional responses were not dignity re relevant because we have I, I think we, we, we should not uh, project into, into the past the situations of the present. Uh, it's a different notion of dignity, a change in the perception of values. Uh, I, no, I would not say that in the past dignity was not important. Certainly it was important. It was a different understanding. And that, in that different understanding, it, the, 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 the need was less focused on the individual and much more on the collective. And therefore, the sacrifice of individuals was much more acceptable. We, we have been discussing for, for maybe the last 20 years, even more, that our society became too much individualistic. Mm -hmm. And that's true. There, but as in many things in life, you have always two sides of the coin. And uh, the, the, the individualism and uh, self-centered approach of people, even some egotism, uh, are, of course, in my perspective, negative aspects, but they were probably a need to foster a, no, a new notion of, the, of dignity which is centered on, on the individual. And that is, I think, a major conquest in terms of building a humanity. So um, I think that a situation like COVID brings back this individualism into the collective in a higher way of understanding things. So um, I'm very optimistic, as you can understand from my words in that respect, but things can always go wrong. But I do think that, at least in this moment, they are going in the, in the positive direction. Uh, you, you were mentioned, or someone was mentioning before, uh, I think maybe team, that some people would say the you should stay to, to protect the others if, uh, in, in terms of religion, for example. Uh, and this approach brings together the individual and the sense of solidarity of the collective. In that sense, I think there is a change, there is a shift. And uh, I, I think it's a positive shift. But yeah. having said this, uh, we have leaders in the world today that focus on the opposite. I was reading uh, this morning, very early in the morning, uh, uh, a congressman from the United States saying that uh, the, the, the president should, the president of the United States should be very clear in saying that, that he would sacrifice lives for the benefit of the community and of the economics. And uh, what, what is new is that when someone says something like this, Many people get shocked. How can a congressman, how can a leader say that uh, we are happy to kill people for the benefit of economics? But we have to understand that this was the normal approach in the past. And the only reason we are changing 
this approach now is because there has been, on one hand, a, a, a change in mindset, the fact that individual life, and on the other hand, economics, because the, 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 we, are, we, are in, we are in a economic depression, but we are still far, far better than, for example, people in ancient Athens. So uh, we have a luxury that uh, people in the past didn't have. So we should not say they were they were not uh, keen on dignity, but their conditions were different from ours. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. I, if I use another, you know, individual and the collective, uh, it's also uh, uh, it's also the two sides, you know, in public health, you know. Are you care? Are you concerned with population, or are you concerned with the future? This is always, you know, in the public health, you know, also the public sectors. And uh, I would, Louis, I would, I would uh, make a comment about because the infectious disease sometimes they affect, you know, the other people. So we call this is the external, you know, the external effect in terms of the. Uh, in terms of the infectious disease uh, concept, so I would rather you know take the collective you know as uh, uh, as one of the priority uh, to uh, to to commit of the people in the community. Then then we try to decentralize you know the uh, which we try to to take care about under this umbrella. How can we uh, also cover the individual? The, the human freedom and also uh, right in the, in the face of the crisis. You know, this is what I try to, to make a comment. But uh, you, but your your concept is absolutely correct. You know because this is a uh, this is concern with uh, the different uh, levels. Thank you. Can I say something? Who is talking? Yeah. I think I just wanted to say something. Who? Oh. Can I speak? Yeah. Asus. Asus, you want to make a comment? Yeah, please. Can I say something? Hello. Hello. Tiso. Yeah, Tiso. Tiso, welcome. But uh, your side always has an echo, so so have you turned off your computer or you... Thank you. Uh, if I move the home, the home, not move from far, far away from the, the late part. Yeah, can you far away from the late part a little bit? On the home? Because, because the, 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 your voice is, is always, you know, it's always echo. Yeah, speak again. <laughs> Pandemical 
but especially for the health immunity in the country for in Nagos. Yeah, I think people ask, it's, uh, again, it's about one pound from uh, Vietnam as well. Uh, can I ask, uh, is it, you know, we want to take some comments for this question? Sure, I think uh, uh, Ron had just answered it very well, meaning that we have to take this as a humbling experience and um, keep uh, the future possibilities open. Um, somehow in this uh, encounter, um, we see that some forces, whether it's natural forces or some other unknown combination of uh, uh, forces, put a very strong stop to all of the lives and things in progression. And uh, we are all provided with an unanticipated uh, moment to uh, breathe, to if we could, and then to live, and then to um, reorient everything. Uh, so we can't say what covert lighting or, or as uh, Lloyd had just said, uh, 20, 21, 22, because we see that in the past at least uh, 4,000 years, these kind of pandemics come back. We don't want them to become chronic, but they have been sticking around. We have to make a way uh, so that we could live with others, not only other humans, other animals, other forms of life, but uh, other things, including uh, the things we call enemies. We can't always maintain this kind of uh, combating spirit uh, with uh, the kind of forces and lives that we live with. Uh, therefore, you know, I think our reflections uh, and, and would have to uh, um, be coming back and think, all right, if our principle about sustainable sustainability in the long run means that to live and that live, uh, we also allow things we call enemies to live in ways that we could accommodate by refashioning our values, our attitudes, our ways of life so that the new normal, as uh, Dean Chan had just uh, uh, laid out for us in a way of a thought, of a refashioning of things, would include uh, not only humans we call enemies, such as Athens called Persians or Spartans, uh, or aliens, uh, the Turkish would call forces from Mongolian and Eurasian continent, but including these uh, uh, forces that we feel that we are at war with, the, the virus. Uh, we don't know how um, the implications of humanity will be, but I think we have to start at the lower end, at the lower level, uh, to allow to make room for open possibilities that Ren and other colleagues uh, mentioned. Yeah, thank you for the reasons. And I think uh, we have uh, the uh, similar question from the other, and uh, they also ask, uh, please, uh, please yeah, they, they ask about the lockdown, this, uh, is uh, ethical or culturally or socially? They, I mean, they, they are, I think all the questions are relevant, you know. For me, you know, everything uh, other than the uh, epidemi epidemi epidemics of the uh, COVID-19 um, belong to the human being. So it's broadly speaking, you know, human being play important role in, you know, in the future of the infection control for COVID-19. You know. So I will ask, uh, you know, several experts to Make a comment, you know, in in, in you know in the short short time. So I will ask the team. You go first, then a source, and also Roten, and uh, uh, and maybe uh, Tiso. You if you want to uh, make a few more remarks, then you would be welcome. So so can can we use this sequence uh, to ask you to uh, to talk more about humility, you know. 
the role of humanity play in this uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So Tim, can you? Are you you are asking me, right? Yeah, yeah. Just just talk about humanity and also because <laughs> they ask the lockdown is a uh, ethical, culturally or socially. So I will ask you and ourselves and also Rotan, you know, yeah. to make a yeah. blue comment and Tiso, if you Tiso can join with it because and uh, uh, and uh, Louis, you can also join, but uh, because time is very very limited. But I would like to ask you as uh, uh, to make I, a few remarks. I, mean, I don't want I don't want you know miss this golden time to her I mean, or as yeah, well. I mean, the, the study of, of religions or the history of religion. And I, I'm not a moral philosopher. I'm not doing normative studies. I'm uh, I'm observing. I'm analyzing. I'm interpreting and uh, trying to explain. Now, it's not my business, so to speak, to tell people what is right or wrong, mm -hmm. what is morally good or morally bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I think moral has to do with social conventions. Mm -hmm. So uh, whatever is right is what, what is within the social order of that and that society, or what is immoral is sort of the asocial or whatever you want to call it. So, so I find the question hard to, to answer in a, in a sort of non-normative way. Uh, what I would like to say also in regard to the question about the future, and here I probably am in line with uh, Laurent Tissot, that, that it, it is difficult for me to sort of not just study profits, but also to act as a prophet. I think that we have uh, seen this COVID-19 uh, arrive quite unexpectedly in a way, and I think that we can see other things arrive in the future quite unexpectedly. Mm. And uh, uh, I, I, uh, I really think that it's be a mixed picture that we're going to see. And, and in terms of, of, for instance, religion and human rights, uh, I touch upon it in my in my written paper. The future is going to be interesting. Uh, in terms of uh, what the question is all about. Uh, is it okay for more and more governments to restrict freedom of religion with regard to, for instance, public health? And uh, I personally think so, but as a scholar, I cannot sort of answer the question because I'm not a legal scholar. But if, if I was a legal human rights scholar, I would go in there and discuss everything about core issues like necessity, proportionality, uh, what is needed in a democratic society, what is a compelling state interest. And, and if I look at the question in, in, in the light of what I know about human rights scholarship and, 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 uh, and legal discussions, then I think, of course, that, that it is okay what has been done so far, because public health does actually allow for governments to restrict whatever rights they have sort of promised to sort of support. Because there are things like health, uh, the respect for others that trump, for instance, um, the right to privacy, the right to freedom of religion, etc. And, and I put my trust in those things. I find it very important that we all recognize that there are things that are bigger than the individual we have to respect others' rights. We have to be in respect of public health and public safety because if we don't have that, it, it's all anarchy. Thank you. Thank you so much. So how about Asus? Yes, well, I mostly agree with, I uh, completely agree with Tim, but also uh, with Luis in his former uh, intervention. I think that, uh, and I, I will see him now, which is the kind of discussion we are, ha we are having in our societies, at least in our, in my society, my own society. The discussion about the limits of the limits that the states and, of course, and governments can introduce uh, to, for the liberty, for the freedom of people in their own acts. Of course, there has to be some kind of balance. It's very difficult in this situation to say uh, which is the limit really, that we can introduce just to, to keep the health of people without leaving out their dignity. And I think that probably this war that has been a 
that has appeared through one of the questions, the, the notion of dignity is probably the most important of that. Things are affordable, things can be supportable as far as people still feel, still feel that uh, the dignity is saved. So it's also the, le the lesson we can, we can get from the past, uh, at least in, not in, in, mainly in, in scientific, uh, scientific publications, but in, uh, in historic publications and also, of course, in literature. The most interesting thing, the thing that is most studied, is how people can stay with their own dignity. Uh, in this in these difficult situations and um, probably not only now but in for the future also I think that this is mainly the, the thing that uh, one of the things that governments can of course uh, need to say not only the health of the people but also the dignity of the people. Thank you very much. Thank you Arsus. So, so Papa Dotten, you want to say something? Yeah. Yes, but what we see today with this COVID-19, and this is an aspect which I have not mentioned so far, is we live in a society where inequalities are huge. And I see COVID-19 must be also reflected in this social dimension. It is abnormal that we see family of four, five, six, living in small uh, lots. So I, I can live confinement here in Switzerland. I have a very nice apartment, so it's not a problem for me. But what the problem for me, many people who are living in such terrible conditions. So and maybe we have to think about what about the equalities for the future. Uh, it, 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 it imagine that the future post COVID-19 will be uh, 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 sync with the same uh, mental map. And we have to see the model are uh, the inequalities not normal. I think this is, apart from the medical cause response to this COVID, this is the important uh, a problem to deal and tackle with the social inequality. But the COVID-19 is absolutely uh, incredible for that because, it, yes, we show what are the inequality. Okay, thank you, Rolton. Finally, you know, uh, I will ask the uh, Lori, huh? Lori, lockdown, lockdown, you know, lockdown is uh, also uh, very uh, relevant to uh, your, you know, your, <coughs> your mention about the sixth, the eighth stage, you know, about the Thomas experience. So I would, I would like to ask you to make some comment about this, uh, uh, the issue of lockdown, you know, from your viewpoint, you know. So Lori, are you here? Are you there? Yeah, I will, I will ask you people because uh, the other people ask about lockdown, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's a let's go social, culturally, and uh, the team and the Absolute and the Lawton already make a few remarks, and uh, I want to make, I, I want you to make some comment as well. Did you want to make some comment? Question I didn't understand. 
Can you see the screen? Yes? Yeah, this is a question I want you I want you to make a comment if you want or or it's uh Yeah, uh, only one question remaining about uh, the, the Thai people want to ask me about the, uh, if the, somebody lied to, uh, to people who are uh, doing the uh, contact investigation about their turbulent history and disease exposure history and uh, how do we deal with these situations. I think in Taiwan, you know, because our government already used the uh, mass media and also their announcement to repeat again and again about how serious it is, you know, if, the, if you cannot reveal, reveal you know, your, 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 your true information. And uh, that would be, uh, that would be very uh, <coughs> bad. And we also have uh, very strict Taiwanese, you know, uh, the Infection uh, Act to punish the people uh, uh, or to find the people uh, who, <coughs> if they have uh, conceived information about the turbulent history or, or exposure histories, because we have a SARS experience. Since, since the experience of the SARS, we already have uh, the regulation and the, the, the law, you know, to uh, regulate such kind of the situations. So, so I don't know in other countries, but uh, uh, in in, in the Asian countries, there are still there have a several countries have a similar, you know, regulation like Taiwan. So, uh, so uh, this is our situation. And uh, I, I said, you know, this time we found people actually have uh, civilization of uh, of knowing how serious it is to uh, to conceal information. So in Taiwan, uh, this situation uh, has has been improved, uh, you know, since the SARS. So this is my brief uh, uh, response to this question. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, we already done the all the question asked from Asian participants. The long I make a project because the time is really really short and limited, so we cannot have an interactive discussion uh, between the commenter and also the uh, the question raised by. Uh, the, the, this participant, I'm sorry. So, but I can suggest you, you know, if you want to ask a, uh, a question uh, uh, from the relevant, you know, expert, you can always 
you know, write an email to ask them. So I think we finish the question time here. And uh, so uh, final question, uh, the final section is uh, uh, because uh, Louis uh, have already suggested and uh, uh, several experts also urge us to uh, make some recommendation uh, for a for the whole section of uh, these uh, online meetings. Yeah, but I would like suggest you know because time is very late, so uh, uh, I would suggest alternative. You know, I will put all the recommendation. You know, and uh, I personally commit to writing this communication with uh, Professor Bing uh, and also our Dean Zhang, you know, then, then we can circulate for all experts within a week, you know, to revise this recommendation and uh, maybe we can put this recommendation together with uh, uh, tomorrow meeting, you know, to, uh, to put some uh, the uh, issue in the journal or in uh, some relevant uh, uh, newsletter. That would be, you know, efficient. So if everyone agree with doing so, uh, I I I would like you know to suggest uh, uh, in this way. Okay, it's okay for everyone. If everyone say yes, then uh, then 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 uh, we we are going to close this uh, meeting very soon. You know I you know I just want to ask our dean to just say. Uh, the final remark in the minutes, you know, then we close this, uh, the, the meeting, because I think this meeting really, really uh, uh, inspiring, uh, at least for me, I learned so much, and uh, so Dean, can you just make a final remark, then we close the meeting, and thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks everybody for this uh, excellent uh, conference, and it's timely, and uh, uh, we will put your uh, wisdom into these uh, recommendations in one week, and hopefully we can uh, contribute to the, the world what we uh, reflect on uh, the ongoing uh, pandemic. And uh, hopefully, uh, in a couple of uh, days or uh, months or years, we can actually have a critical meeting somewhere for this. But uh, with this, I think that um, uh, we, we all uh, have achieved something uh, mission impossible. And, uh, <laughs> and with this, uh, I, think I congratulate everybody of your uh, hard work and uh, cooperations. And uh, I will officially conclude this is the end of our uh, today's conference. See you. Okay. Thank you so much.